Today's Bible passage presents us with one giant ass of a problem. You see, in three of the Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on only one donkey. But in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus sends the disciples to fetch two donkeys, a jenny, which is a female donkey, along with a colt, or a male donkey. Where does Matthew get the second blue donkey? And to make things worse, he says Jesus sits on them, plural. How does Jesus manage to sit on two different donkeys for the ride into Jerusalem? These are the questions we will answer in today's video. Matthew claims Jesus fulfilled a prophesied donkey ride from the book of Zechariah. Zechariah announces, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, a son of Jenny's. When Matthew cites this, he says, Behold, your king is coming to you. He leaves out the line about righteousness and salvation. Then he says, Humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, a son of a Jenny. At this point, Matthew has been criticized by those who claim he misunderstood the book of Zechariah. In Zechariah, we have an example of synonymous parallelism, where the second line repeats the first line with additional nuancing. In other words, there are not two donkeys here. The donkey in the first line is the same as the colt, a son of Jenny's, in the second line. Critics claim Matthew has two donkeys in his story because he misunderstood this bit of Hebrew poetry. They say he thought the first line about the donkey and the second line about the colt were referring to two different donkeys. Then allegedly, Matthew changed the Jesus story, incorporating the second donkey in order to accommodate his misunderstanding of Zechariah. As you can imagine, people have been pelting Matthew with donkey doo-doo ever since. I was inspired to make this presentation after watching a video by Rabbi Singer from Outreach Judaism, who polemicizes against Matthew's alleged misunderstanding as the sure proof that Matthew cannot be trusted when he cites the Hebrew Bible. His objection resonates with many scholars in the Western tradition. In the mid-19th century, the double donkey incident drove Strauss to say Matthew writes myth, not history. It drove Strecker to claim that Matthew belongs to a later Gentile generation. And some more recent New Testament scholars have followed suit. Matthew has misunderstood. He has exercised unusual freedom in his handling of Zechariah. And he is frequently careless with physical details to the point that we shouldn't even try to imagine how Jesus could have commandeered two donkeys. So the question is, is Matthew really such a jackass? Or are these guys just acting like a bunch of Eeyores? In response, I want to provide you with a couple of options to help explain what Matthew is doing. We begin with why Jesus would have needed two donkeys in the first place. Despite what you might think, donkeys can be unruly. Just look at this guy attempting to jihad on the back of his donkey. Mark's Gospel gives us a valuable clue. He claims the colt Jesus used had never been ridden before. Using an unbroken colt to navigate an excited crowd at Passover time is nearly impossible. That is why when colts are broken, they're usually attended by their mothers. Matthew likely knows, either from living in a world that herded donkeys or from his knowledge of the historical Jesus, that the inexperienced colt required its mother in order to complete the journey into Jerusalem. Remember, Matthew specifically tells us the second donkey was a female, raising the probability that it was the colt's mother. Ancient Jews understood this well. In the Baba Batra, there's a line about how it is inappropriate to separate a mother Jenny from her young, which is contrasted in the following line by cows, which can more readily be separated from their offspring. However, this only explains part of the problem. We can see from Mark and what we know about donkey herding why the historical Jesus needed two donkeys. But Matthew seems to indicate that both donkeys are part of the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. How does this work? I'll share two possible solutions. According to the first one, Matthew may really have gotten two donkeys from each line of the parallelism, not because he misunderstood Hebrew poetry, but because Jews in first century Palestine commonly divided up parallelisms in this way due to their belief that God intended a deeper, additional revelation in the second line. In his Cambridge dissertation on the way Jews read the Hebrew Bible before 70 CE, Brewer explains that Jews typically rejected poetic parallelisms because they didn't believe God would repeat himself in an unnecessary way. Quote, every detail in scripture is significant, 
a legislator strives to make every word in a legal text unambiguous and to remove every unnecessary word or phrase. So the divine legislator was assumed to have created a perfect law in which every word and letter was significant. Now let's briefly look at some examples of how ancient Jews did this. Ecclesiastes 1.15 says the crooked cannot be straightened and that which is lacking cannot be counted. Everyone agrees this is synonymous parallelism. Yet Rabbi Hillel, reputed to be the greatest rabbi of that era, refused to see repetition here. He accepted that the first line was about the wicked. To avoid repetition, he said the second line referred to someone who was absent when his friends placed his name with their sacrifice at the temple, but later the man refused to be counted with his friends. In Malachi 3.18, we get another parallelism. And you will return and distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between him who serves God and him who serves him not. Again, Hillel looks for a way out of the parallelism. He accepts that the righteous and him who serves God are the same. The wicked, however, are different from those who do not serve God because according to Hillel, the one who does not serve God in this passage simply didn't serve him in this one instance. It doesn't mean that he is like the wicked and never serves God at all. Another example, this time from Genesis Rabbah. At 49.11, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Here, parallelism was avoided by claiming the first line was a reference to white wine, and the second line was a reference to red wine. And for a final example, the Dead Sea Scrolls take the Messianic passage in Numbers 24.17 and divide it into two messiahs. A star shall come out of Jacob, which they take to be the priestly messiah, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, which they take as the Davidic messiah. So what's the point of all this? People have accused Matthew of not being Jewish because he divided a parallelism to get two donkeys from Zechariah's prophecy. But if that is true, then Hillel, the authors of Genesis Rabbah, and the Qumran community are also not Jewish. The reality is, Matthew's attempt to get more out of the parallelism is the manifest proof that he was a first century Jew from the land of Israel, since Brewer has shown that Jews stopped reading the Bible this way after 70 AD. While I admit this is a possible solution, one that has satisfied several scholars, I'll show you one that I like better. Instead of understanding Matthew to get a donkey out of each line of the parallelism, Matthew has followed the parallelism in keeping with the poetic form. He understands that the donkey in the first line is the same as the colt in the second line, but then he gets his second donkey out of the final reference to Jenny's, which again would accord with the ancient Jewish habit of seeing no detail in the text as inconsequential. This has a lot of explanatory potential because Zechariah's final reference is to female donkeys, and Matthew tells us the donkey with the colt in his story was also a female. And when Matthew quotes Zechariah, notice that he says a son of a Jenny, singular, instead of Zechariah's son of Jenny's. Zechariah used the generalizing plural, son of Jenny's, in the same way the Bible poetically speaks of a man as one born of women. But of course, Matthew understands that a particular cult has only one mother, and since in this prophecy's fulfillment, it is the mother that stabilized the anxious young cult, he quoted it in the singular to help us make the connection between the prophecy and the triumphal entry. Also, the term Matthew uses for Jenny here, Ipozigiu, means beast of burden. This makes sense because Matthew explicitly identifies only the Jenny as the one tied up when the disciples discover the two donkeys, helping us identify the second donkey, the female, with the last part of Zechariah's prophecy. You see, Matthew hasn't misunderstood the parallelism at all. One male donkey because Zechariah spoke of a colt, and one female donkey because the prophecy referenced the colt's maternal descent. The only problem that remains is the line that says Jesus sat on them. How does one sit on more than one donkey? Again, I'll share two possibilities. If we look at the line in context, it claims they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. The word cloaks is the nearest antecedent to the word them. In other words, when Jesus sat on them, it doesn't mean the donkeys. It means the cloaks strewn on the colt. 
This is the simplest and most straightforward working of the grammar, and just like that, the problem disappears. I admit this is a possibility, and a lot of scholars have bought this explanation, but I don't. Here's why. The word them has been used so repetitively in the context as referring to the donkeys that it feels unnatural to think it now refers to clothing. Untie them and bring them to me. The Lord needs them. They put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. In each case, them is the same Greek word and in each case it refers to the donkeys. So is there a better explanation? I think there is. Matthew is using an expression called a synecdoche, which is where you mention a part to refer to the whole, or you mention one member to refer to the whole group. In this case, when Jesus rides upon the colt, Matthew refers to the colt and mother Jenny Pear as a single unit. Why does he do this? Matthew is working hard to help his audience see connections between Jesus and the Old Testament. And whenever there is a plural in the Old Testament, Matthew imports it into the story of Jesus to help his audience see the Old Testament connection more clearly. For example, Matthew consistently portrays Jesus as a prophet like unto Moses. In Exodus 4.19, Moses is told to go back to Egypt for all those, plural, who were seeking your life are dead. In Matthew 2, when Herod dies, it says, rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel for those, plural, who sought the child's life are dead. Even though only Herod has died, Matthew discusses it in the plural to help his audience make the connection with the book of Exodus. So when Matthew takes his historical knowledge that the cult needed its mother and combines this with the prophecy that mentions a donkey in connection to its mother, he uses the plural language of he sat on them, even though it's awkward, in order to help his audience establish the link with the plurality of donkeys mentioned by Zechariah. There are many asses in this picture. There's the two in the story, there's those who accused Matthew before they knew what he was doing, and then there's the guy making the video. But after the last ass is counted, we can be confident that Matthew will not be among them. He used the ancient Jewish methods of interpretation to show how Jesus is the prophesied Messiah, and he used linguistic expressions to help us see the connection between the story he tells and the story Israel's prophets foretold. Maybe Matthew's critics would have known this had they ceased to be critical and instead had taken time to learn how to read scripture through ancient eyes.